Greeting Ray, how are you doing today? I'm doing really good, and you? Very good. So today we are really, really excited uh, to have you. You're actually going to come uh, teach at Filia from March 18 to April 1st. So that's two full weeks at Filia, but 10 days really focused on the process of becoming a breatharian. That's right. So tell us more about it and uh, tell us about your, your background first because uh, and I'm sure many people don't really understand what breatharian is about. So maybe you could give us a quick introduction. Wait, first, first, I don't want him to give a quick introduction. I'm going to do something first and then turn it over to him, okay? Okay. So, um, okay, so the, for those of you that don't know, this, this new retreat center that we have procured is really really amazing it's down in costa rica and we are going to be having over the course of the lifetime of this retreat a bunch of experts in different fields and so obviously breatharianism is something that i've been interested in for many many years and i love the idea of it but it is it must be done a certain way and so for somebody in my line of work what i have been watching is people going to these breatharian workshops and coming back sicker and sicker and sicker than when they even went in. And it's a real frustration for someone in my line of work because I know that breatharianism is possible. It has been done for thousands of years and successfully. So there's, there's like a disconnect between a lot of the current people who are teaching the transition into breatharianism and what should be done as far as I'm concerned. And so mm -hmm. here we have Ray, who is one of the very few experts on the planet actually for for correctly initiating people into a breatharian lifestyle. So we have chosen him for the expert for that workshop for that reason. So now let's hear about how you got into this whole thing. Wow, there's a lot to talk about. Um, well, for me, I had to meet a breatharian, a friend that actually was initiated, initiated in Brazil. And we were like cooperating, we were volunteering both in this like hippie place in Tel Aviv. We were about a hundred of us doing wonderful things for humanity, you know, going on buses and making people sing mm -hmm. and going visiting patients that don't have any family and stuff like that. And one day he just came to me in quiet, in silence, took me to the side and told me, Ray, I have to tell you something amazing. And, and then it was like, I haven't eaten in like a year and seven months. And immediately my mental body, immediately my thought was like, what do you mean? What, what do you mean? So what do you do for it? I said, I just drink and I drink occasionally and I enjoy it. I became a pranic, we called it, or a breatharian. And then he started explaining it to me. With time, I took some time to digest this news. And eventually after about a month, I told him, I have to understand this. I felt a call from my future self, as if guided by the intuitions, felt it right here in my tummy, telling me, Ray, this is your path, you have to do this, this is so cool. And somehow I'm both spiritual and materialistic. I'm a scientist and I'm, 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 I'm all, all of those things together, so I wanted it for a challenge. I said, this is breaking the laws of science that I know today. I want to break this paradigm. I have to do this. So I was initiated about four and a half years ago by him. I did 21 days, seven days without food or water. And that type of initiation, all the guides today, we don't recommend it anymore. And that's the type of initiation that you probably saw some of your own participants or followers. And we don't do that anymore because it's so difficult for the body and for the mind. Mm -hmm. And the person is simply not balanced. Now, in the Western society, in the Western world, we have stressful jobs, we, we need to acquire some money, we can't just live up in some mountain and meditate all day. So we have to balance it and make it more proper, you know? So when I teach this, I teach it from both sides of the brain. It has to be an emotional part, it has to be from the mental side, understanding scientific, and it has to come from the abstract. It has to be very balanced, and that's what I believe in. That's why I've been living in a city all my life. I don't have to go to nature as a breatharian. I don't have to meditate every day. I just got used to it. But also, in the beginning, I was very extreme. In the first year, I didn't eat anything. I just drank a little bit. But today, when I teach my participants, I always tell them, we need about a month, a month and a half, and remaining just on juice. Let the body get used to it and the consciousness clear out every old programming. And from then on, do whatever you want. 
whatever you want doesn't mean start eating every day all the time because your mind won't you know your mind won't make the shift oh, yeah. you'll have to get used to it and when you feel ready then go back to different habits but out of a free freedom I, I find that the transition into breatharianism the most difficult thing for people to face isn't even the way that the physical body reacts it's what happens in your mind because you go through such an intense detoxification that's right so, you don't even you don't even understand that you were addicted to something until you define it as an addiction and yeah. then you realize my god Ever since we were born, we cried, and then our mom gave us a TV full of milk, and then we created the first emotional connection between food and emotion. So now, all of us are eating out of a necessity because we are bored, because we are heartbroken, because the fridge is here, because it's 2 o'clock and our colleagues are telling us that they're hungry, and then we immediately think. But when we are in the present moment, when we are in the flow, we have a much higher percentage of pranic intake. That means when you are in love, you don't eat as much yep. and you don't think about it. When you are enjoying a project that you're doing, you don't eat as much. The whole day goes by. And that is why it's called energetic nourishment. The, the normal person is only nourished a few percentage. Healers, people who are in a higher state of being, that do whatever they really want in life, you know, they have a little higher percentage of, of pranic intake. But the people who go through the initiation, they get elevated to 60, 70, even 80% pranic energetic intake. And that is the transition. That is when your body stops telling you that it's hungry. It just tells you, you want something? Enjoy the experience. Don't sit and eat like a pig in front of the television. Close your eyes, enjoy it. Eat slowly. It's like, uh, it's like if you haven't made love in two weeks, then the first time you will make love, it will be much more passionate. So now, when I eat, I do eat every two or three days, I will eat a meal, I enjoy it much more, because I know I don't need it. It's not out of a hunger to satisfy myself. It's out of a freedom of choice. Yes, yeah, so of course, many people uh, hearing these videos are going to be very skeptical. And, That's right. Uh, so we have, uh, as you said, we have several ways to uh, nourish ourselves. Uh, physical food, yeah. water, and air. I mean. In the 3D, our physical body are, are, are made of physical matter. So, for example, and every day your body evaporates a lot, so you're losing water, uh, you have to repair your uh, tissues. So, where are you getting this material now that you don't eat anymore? From, uh, well, you should, you should think about it. There's two ways of looking at it. If you really, really don't understand it and don't want to go into it, instead of saying, that I'm creating something out of thin air, you can say that my body's productivity has gone to the top, meaning yeah. the little bit that I put into the body, the body knows how to use in the maximum capacity. Just like a small child that will eat a little brick of chocolate and you will have energy for 24 hours running on it. So the body of the breatharian has taught itself how to be much more productive. But if you want to take it to the next level, meaning even look at the people who don't eat or don't drink, then we know that the pineal gland serves as the interpreter of energetic, spiritual energy to actual material that our body will use. The breatharians, and there's only a few of them in the world, that take it to the maximum capacity and don't even drink, they open up a small hole right above here, mm -hmm. and they say that they're actually sucking something that they call the liquid of life. And this is exactly the location of the pineal gland, meaning on the, on the X, Y, Z dimensions, it's right in the middle. It's exactly where, it, and it, to me, when I did eight days without food and water in the television experiment that we're probably going to talk about, I actually started opening it. I felt it changing. And two of my participants already taught about 200 people. Two of my participants, it happened to them in just a four-day dry fast. So I think it has to do something with our genetics, with our will, with our intention. But the shift begins to occur. One of those people, there's only two that I know that don't drink water, he went through a very difficult transition. He actually lost all his teeth in the process, oh. and then he grew a new set of teeth, sort of like a shark or, a, you know, like a, a baby. So it means that we have three sets of potential teeth. But this is not a Western breatharian style. Most of the breatharians I know, they eat occasionally, they enjoy it, they drink mostly juice or, or shakes occasionally. This is a very far out. This is something that we usually don't, don't do, and there's no reason to do it. Yeah, I mean, throughout history, we've heard of these men performing miracles, especially after experiencing enlightenment. But even Till herself has some really special uh, 
abilities. So I want to go back to your retreat. As you said, it's not for everyone. It looks like uh, people who are able to receive that uh, initiation have to have probably a specific background. So I want to go back in your experience. Uh, what's the success rate of people attending your retreat? And what type of uh, profile of people have the highest chance to succeed in that initiation? And Tim, you well, want to I'm, say something? I'm going to turn it over to him in a minute. But I feel yeah. like for a, for a workshop like this, I mean, what we're dealing with with a, with a breatharian transition is such a high level of let's say, conversion out of matter into spiritual practice that you cannot think in terms of success. It's, a, it's basically an, an initiation, means that whatever happens the minute that somebody that commits to it is supposed to happen for their growth. So if you start to measure success by virtue of how many people are able to stay off food or something like that, you've already like, missed the point of the entire thing. So. Mm -hmm. So that's all I had to say before turning it back. Well, I can say it on, on two levels. The level that we can actually count in numbers. If we say what is a breatharian, and I can say my own definition, is a person that is no longer in need and that the body will say that it's hungry. If that is how we judge it, then the number of people who transfer, the percentage is more than 50% of success rate. If we compare it to the 21-day process, we're talking about 10% because it was so difficult back in the day and we were only just a few pioneers and society judges you and your mother judges you and your girlfriend judges you because you're eating less than her and it's become a whole different social game uh, completely. And today I can say it's about 50%, which is really good. But that's usually because I have two special workshops during the initiation about how we can integrate this into our life. It's very important for me because I understand that every time we go out of this vipassana or vision quest or anything, we go out and we go exactly back to our old life. It's like it became a hole in our life. And then we say, oh, I didn't learn anything. And here you have learned a lot. You're going to change either way. Some people come just for the 10-day process to see because we're pushing our own limits and we're pushing the limits of science. And we suddenly see what a group energy and a group intention can actually bring to us. We understand unity on a much deeper level. So I think that the success rate is about 50 or 60 percent right now. I don't think it's going to change. I do, because you asked me about who is supposed to do this, whoever hears an inner call to do it. Some people, they do it because they don't want to lose weight or be famous or because the ego wants to conquer an impossible mountain to climb. And I say to them, look, maybe it's not your time right now. Even though I had a little thing with ego myself and I was like, wow, this is amazing, I want to do it. And it's okay, because we all have an ego, it's a part of the, the, you can say, personality right now. But whoever hears this call and says, wow, this is possible, and then he starts dreaming about it, and then he starts thinking about it, starts telling himself, oh my God, if this is real, I have to experience it. And when the doubt and the fear kicks in, then you know that you need to do it, because you want to conquer that doubt and fear, and, and fear because you want to expand and to grow and to learn. It's something that you can't even... You can't even uh, resist it. You just tell yourself, I want to do this. And when they meet me, usually they see that I'm completely normal. I work in a Western world job. I do visit a lot of other countries and teach. But I work about 50% of the time in a normal job, and 50% of the time I travel and, and teach the tender process, or consciousness, or manifestation, or whatever. But I've learned all these things through my breathing initiation, or through my breathing lifestyle, because I started understanding you know, it's, it's some things that science doesn't even talk about, like the placebo effect. It's so simple and everybody knows about it, but nobody's talking about how our mind, how our belief system changes the body and what is the limit. If science right now tells you that you, you have to drink after three days or you'll die, and suddenly I go online and go on a television and I show them that it's eight days, then science has to confront it and it has to say that it's just because of the will and the body, the change of the thought, you know? So I can tell you, most, like 70% of, 75% of the people will probably be vegetarian or vegans, meaning people who already have compassion towards animals in the world, because you have people who eat meat, but usually they will do the 10-day process and they will go back to eating. It's just a different vibration. I don't, don't mean to judge anybody. I'm just saying that this is the generalization. Um, more girls than men. Yeah. Any age, some people 18, some people, I did two people from, uh, from Mount Shasta, 70 years old. 
a couple. And I was like, I was scared, you know, as a guide, I don't know. And they passed it magnificently. Like, it was beautiful. They didn't have any trouble at all. And I was amazed. And then I said, okay, Ray, you were a little bit skeptic. It's time to break your own limitation and open yourself up. But I do not accept people who have illnesses that I don't know about or they're more difficult. I ask them, if you're sick, can you fast without your medicine for four days at least? That's the bare minimum. And if they say no, then I say, so oh, thank you very much. No pregnant women allowed. A lot of things that you know, you say, why would they want to do this right now? It's not good. The whole body goes through a transformation. So it's a big change. I can't risk it. But anyone who hears an inner call, amazing. I, I love these people. It's all the light workers. It's like you two, you know, we meet as a family. Everyone knows all this cool stuff. Everybody did different spiritual ceremonies out there. And we have a lot to discuss and a lot of things that we have in common. It's pretty neat. In fact, I'm, I'm actually considering doing your retreat in a couple of months. So I put myself in that position, but that's why I realized the power of belief because I was taught at school, more than two days without water, you die. So I started to be scared, oh, but maybe I'm gonna die. So that's why I have this next question for you, is uh, describe more your 21 day process, which obstacles and challenges you had to face yourself? Because with a difficult initiation, only 10% of people make it. So I'm sure you had your own struggles during that 21 days period. So tell us more about it and what did you have to conquer within yourself? And most people don't know what a 21 day, what, what this whole initi 21 day initiation that you did is. So you should probably explain That's that. That's right. Okay, so back in the day, I think 36 years ago, um, the Western world received a message about how to become a breatharian. It was received in Australia, and it was written by a woman named Jasmine that became the first breatharian to expand this knowledge. And back in the day, they just received the guidelines of being 21 days in solitude, having a person just check up on you once a day, first seven days without food or water, do it by yourself, no Facebook, no Gmail, you can read some books, you can meditate, and there's some you know, special meditations that you do during that time. I can tell you, for me, the hardest point was the boredom. Being by yourself for so long, and suddenly, you know, you become in a meditative state, constant meditative state. Now, you hardly sleep, and nobody explained to me that you hardly sleep in these type of processes because you don't drink or eat, and the body needs a lot of energy during sleep to digest, and suddenly you don't sleep. You see the sunset, you see the sunrise, you meditate most of the day, you read, you do art, that opened up my art, but there were two or three days that I was like, Checking up with myself, mind games, mind games. What are you doing here? Why, why do you need to do this? You're already like 30 years old, man. Why do you need to constantly prove and push your limits? And then I was talking to an aunt for like two hours, explaining the whole situation to her, seeing how she reacted. She didn't really understand me, you know, it's an aunt. And so you go a little bit crazy for a while, but then you understand why you're doing this. To be bored is to allow the conscious mind to completely shut down. And when the conscious mind is completely shut down, suddenly your subconscious, higher guides, higher self, however you want to call it, it comes up with ideas, with concepts, with downloads, with information. You, you feel so good because you're suddenly understanding that you're not your emotions, you're not your thoughts, you're not this physical body, you're something much beyond that. And that is finally in touch with you. So there's good things about it and there's bad things about it. because. Uh, I can say that most of my participants they didn't have that. A lot of people come with emotional baggages. Um, some women, you know, they were molested sexually when they were children and it comes up. Suddenly you remember a lot of things because the breathing initiation requests from your inside to clean up everything in your past. And you need to come to it like a, a caterpillar and you come out like a butterfly. So that's why during the 10-day initiation there's a karmic cleansing exercise there's days that we are concentrating only on cleaning whatever it is that we have aggregated in our life. And for me, it was a push into the deep water. I didn't have much help. We were only three Pridarians in the whole country. I live in Israel. So we were the pioneers. But when I came out of there, I knew that I had to write a book about it. I knew that I had to, to make a, a website about it. I didn't know that my future is so connected. Like, I didn't know that this is what I'm supposed to do. But then when I started teaching it, you know how it feels like when you're doing whatever it is that you're supposed to do. Yeah. Energy, it flows, you channel it, you, you don't even think. You become, you put yourself on the side and you become this thing. And that's why I reached out to you guys. 
I was uh, amazed by your work. I've been following you for a few years now, too. And I didn't actually know that you got married, so congratulations. <laughs> and, uh, and I was so happy to meet you, to talk with you before, and to arrange this uh, amazing retreat in, in your new hotel there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it feels to me it's like uh, through that initiation, you're bringing all the power to the subconscious with the conscious. That's how you're able to acquire this superpower skills and and to speaking about boredom it's very interesting because this is yeah, okay this is <laughs> yeah. so we basically this this um week he and i have been in like you know how in couples you get in like fun arguments they're not like serious arguments mm -hmm. <laughs> one of our fun arguments this week has been about how intensely as a creator i need boredom i've been actually telling him make me bored and you're going to start to see this real creative side of me again yeah. So like, I need that space in order to fill it up with something. And so when most people are sitting there, like, you know, looking around the room, like, what am I going to do with myself and getting antsy? That is when I feel like the most in the flow. And it's exactly what you say. I will forget to eat for 24 hours. It'll be just like, you know, I'm just so in it. And it's not like I am depleted. I'm the opposite of depleted. I'm never more alive than that moment. But I, do, I think it's just so funny. It's why earlier when you're like, you know, it's the space of boredom where the best creation happens. I'm looking at him like, see, I told you, because we got in that, that little spat this week. Yeah, and, uh, and like it you makes were, perfect sense also. Yeah, I'm very much in the mental sphere as well, like you. Very, yeah. And I remember when I was a teenager, my most difficult emotion was boredom. I just couldn't stop boredom. I had to fill my time with always something to do. Oh, and let me I tell you. I just couldn't handle it. This is going to be fun when he <laughs> attends this workshop because I swear to God, if there is five seconds of free space, this man has to fill it. I have never seen a man that makes himself more busy in my oh, life. Oh, you're going to be challenged, my friend. Yeah. You're going to be very challenged. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So. so, in fact, question about digestion. Uh, before you were a breatharian, how many hours did you use to sleep and how many hours do you sleep now? I used to sleep about uh, seven and a half, eight. Immediately after the initiation, I went down to about four and today I average at five and a half, six. So the rule of thumb is about two thirds of what you used to. And it really depends on whatever it is that you're doing. Because breatharians, they fast a lot. And the days that you fast, you sleep a little bit less and your dreams become much more vivid. I, I love your definition of, of this breatharianism. It's, I feel like it's one of the most healthy definitions mm -hmm. that I've ever heard. Because in the Western world, we are black and white thinkers, and we love to think like, okay, so breatharian, it, it basically doesn't eat or doesn't drink. You know, we don't think of breatharianism in terms of somebody who has, um, let's say, diminished their attachment to, to food or to needing to take energy from something else. And so I, I love that about you. It is pretty much the reason that I was like, this is the guy that I'm going to pick. You know, the world is going towards individuality, and we don't want any more definitions, meaning even a vegetarian that occasionally eats fish, it's not a flexitarian, because until now we've always been working with the rules of society, what is normality for us. And now we are breaking those boundaries and we want to be who we truly are. We cannot walk around with these templates anymore. The spiritual person that has to meditate or do yoga, or the hard earned person that doesn't feel anything. We're becoming more and more ourselves and we're letting go of the old energies. And that's why I allow this a lot of flexibility. I wasn't flexible with myself. I had to learn it in, in a very bad way, you know, a whole year. So my resistance was building up. I was like watching my family eat in what you call Christmas and different holidays. And I was just sitting around with them, drinking a bowl of filtered soup, you know, just water with taste and enjoying it and, and telling myself, yeah, Ray, you don't need this, you know, the, the, let the animals eat and you can just enjoy watching them. And, and it was very judgmental. I was judging humanity for allowing small kids to die in Africa. And all of this was built up in a year. And in the end of the year, I had a whole family pizza just to break that. And I was, my, my stomach was going like, whoa. Now, it was breaking my mind because we were, because we were so little, we were afraid that we were going to break the prana. But we didn't understand that once you open this engine, then the engine remains open. You just transfer this energy from nourishment, physical nourishment, to energy from prana. And now you have two engines working simultaneously. 
the longer you get used to being in a higher state of vibration and with pranic nourishment, then the engine is going to remain just open. Whatever it is that you're going to eat, your body is actually not going to digest it as much. It's going to go quicker through the system and you won't feel as bad afterwards. You won't have this thing like most people have after lunch, that they eat lunch and then it's like, oh, I'm so full. And then the productivity goes down at work or things like that. And the second thing that happened is that I understood that if you don't get hungry, you don't get full. It is the same nerve system in the stomach, meaning you can eat and drink and you won't be satisfied like before. Because when we are normal, we eat until we're full, and then we stop, wait a few hours, we're hungry again, and then we eat. And as a breatharian, suddenly you don't have a definition of breakfast or a regular schedule, and what is lunch and what is dinner. So you can just go on days, you can eat a few days, you can fast. You play around with it a lot. And I really like, I like that. I like the freedom. I came for the freedom, for the detachment. And I love that. Yeah. I have a friend, Jacques, uh, Jacques Conan, one of my friend and spiritual teacher for about 20 years. So he was a breatharian for over six months, but he told me what was the hardest for him was not to become a breatharian, but to start eating again, because mm -hmm. uh, he had stopped for so long that his uh, organism had really hard time digesting food again. I know you stopped for one full year eating food. Yeah. So how was, that, how was it for you to start eating food again after this full abstinence? Actually, I have to tell you that for me, it wasn't hard, but I know some people that had to do it gradual. I think that there's something with me. Uh, my body is working on a different type of energy. Uh, it's very open. Everything is very light. I gain muscle very easily. I, I never get sick. But I can tell you the statistic, and the statistic is that if you begin too fast too much, then immediately you will feel bad. Your body will want first some juices, then some shake, and then introduce a, a soup and then go into the heavier digestive things like uh, cheese or milk products or anything like that. Yeah, but for me it was, it was kind of easy. Actually, I really flew into this, uh, how, how would Deepak Chopra would say, the path of least resistance. It was really easy for me to just go into it. I never think much about what other people tell me, and I saw that this is, this is what is most difficult for breatharians. It's what other people say, how to explain yourself, how to fit in social circumstances and situations, how to explain it to your crazy grandmother that just wants to feed you, oh, stuff like no. that. You run into the identification as food the minute you change anything about the way you're eating. Because, I mean, it's like you don't know how identified your culture mm -hmm. is or your society or humanity in general is a food unless you change something. I can't tell you mm -hmm. just even as, you know, I was a vegetarian my whole life and got crap for it my whole life. You know, the whole thing about like, oh my gosh, you're going to be protein deficient. Oh my gosh, you're not going to have enough iron. You're this whole mantra, basically. Go to veganism, it's even worse. And then, like, I can only imagine. Now suddenly when everybody's doing their holiday meal and you're not eating, how that makes everyone else feel. And how it brings up yeah. everybody's attachment issues with food. It must be super uncomfortable. It was, until I did the television show. And then everybody was like, okay... This is something different. And then they stopped judging. They started asking the right questions, you know. Is it possible? How is it possible? Because we saw it, you know. And, uh, yeah, I can explain a few minutes just about that show. You guys remember? Did you see it? Yes, in fact, I watched a couple of episodes. In fact, I think this is something really good to cover for the skeptics. Because you, mm -hmm. you started advertising yourself as a breatharian teacher. And, of course, many people didn't believe you. So uh, this Israeli channel put you to test, and uh, so I think it lasted eight days, and they had cameras everywhere. That means they were nowhere to escape. Making so, sure that he wasn't secretly eating ho hos in his closet. Yes. <laughs> so tell us more about that setup. How did they ensure you wouldn't you you couldn't fool them? And then I would like to hear from you their own reaction over time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the first thing was like setting it up. Uh, two of the researchers found me, you know, they came to one of my lectures and they told me that this uh, host wants to talk with me and he's a very famous, very skeptic host in Israel. He's like, doesn't believe anything. Yeah. So he wanted to prove that I'm, that I'm a fraud. Mm -hmm. Immediately when I came, met him, I hugged him. He was like, whoa, he's not a hugger, I guess. <laughs> and, and then he was like, you know, Ray, I really like what you're saying. It doesn't make any sense. I want to put you on live television in an experiment. And I was like, yeah, this is what I came for. 
So we went and we interviewed some doctors. None of the doctors wanted to participate because they're saying that I'm actually putting myself in life danger and they cannot be a part of it because they don't want their license revoked, obviously. Every doctor told us three, four days, top, the guy is going to have this and this blood test, he's going to faint, he won't be able to walk or talk, we'll have to hospitalize him with, you know, with a stretcher. And we were like, cool, so let's do twice as much, twice as long, just to show that the breatharian can extend it. We won't do much more than that. And they even rented, the place that they rented, we put eight cameras everywhere. I had marks where I'm not allowed to go, so the cameras are always visible. If I wanted to brush my teeth, I had to take a, a glass and mark a line. I fill the glass up, I went like this, goggle, and spit back and showed the camera that it's exactly the same line, so they see that I don't take even one sip. I wasn't allowed to take a shower above my head. I was allowed to sleep only with the lights on. It was very, very scientific. And there was a guy that uh, actually made a wager with me. It was a wager for $100,000. And it was a one-way wager. I was like, look, man, I don't know, I never did this with people watching, people coming and interviewing, bothering me every day. Never took blood tests. And he was like, no, I'm sure that it's not going to work. You're a big ass fraud. I'm willing to put $100,000. And this guy is actually paying me now. It was like, there was like a lawsuit. There was a contract. One of the things in the contract was raise alive, raise blood tests have been approved by a medical doctor, ta, 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 ta. And after about four days, the energy of the host and the people around me started changing. Four days I was like, you know, being ridiculed and laughed upon. I was just strong, I was being myself. I didn't say anything, I didn't want them to take out of me drama or ego. I didn't want to say I'm right because who knows what can happen. And once I did that, after about four days he came to me, the host. He told me, listen Ray, I can't say the word prana on live TV, but there's something really special about this. Nobody has ever done this successfully. There have been experiments in the past that have failed in different countries. And then, that's the point that everything changed. He started really appreciating me. The doctor was saying, like, he was checking my tongue. He saw that my tongue is still wet. He was like, look, something is not possible. Everything I said about the blood test. And he was really, really using, like, numerical figures. He was saying, this is going to go down. This. He said, your blood tests haven't changed even one bit. And you're standing here seven days after you're supposed to supposedly begin to faint and feel bad and get dizzy. And he was so surprised. He actually said all the right things. I was, I was, I was thought he was going to say, nah, it, it makes sense, and maybe he went into the pool and you drink or you cheat. And he said, no. He said, this is not scientifically proven. I don't know what breatharians are. I don't like to define anything. He went like this. But this experiment, I declare it as a success. And now everyone that is skeptical, he can know that you, and he told me you, I told him it's not me, it's a way of life. We said you can extend your abilities. You can become a little bit more than other people. You can now go in the desert for a week. You can do many things that other people can't do right now. And I told him, I understand that, and you will see that in the future, a part of humanity will want to live this lifestyle. And it's not about the food. We enjoy the food, food is fine. It's a consciousness leap to get to a certain vibration, and with that comes other things. It comes a connection, a clarity. If you guys will fast, if you guys do a detox occasionally, you probably understand what I'm talking about. There's a clarity that comes after a day or two when the first initial cleansing is, is commenced. And then you're like, you feel good, you feel energized, and you start, wait, why do I eat three times a day? But you get back to the habit because you're so used to it and because people around you expect it and you don't want to feel too, that you're not normal, you know, you want to belong deep down inside. <laughs> That's going to be my shadow. My shadow with breatharianism is going to be belonging. I already know it. I can feel it. <laughs> well, you're a challenge. I, I see what we do with that. So let's talk about emotional attachment and food. In fact, where you're coming from a culture which is the most identified with food, for the Jewish people, food is survival, food is love. So it's very interesting to me that you came from that culture uh, you must receive so much pressure mm -hmm. all the time from your family, your parents and grandparents. Uh, like if, if you don't eat their food, you don't love them, right? It's something uh, <laughs> hard to face. <laughs> it was in the beginning, but no, my, my family were all sort of like uh, spiritual people and my mom actually lives in Canada. 
my father is an Orthodox Jew, and I have eight more half brothers, so we don't really keep in touch that much. <laughs> so it's easier on the family part. It was harder with the friends. It was harder to to give up some things, but I never really treated food with that much respect as I do today. I was always like eating on the way, saying it's just fuel. I just want to, you know, keep moving. And today I appreciate taste and flavor much more than I, than I used to. Yeah. By the way, I just want to add that whoever wants to watch the experiment, it's online in my website. It's uh, raymaor.com. There's uh, English uh, subtitles for it, and it's open. And I think many people are viewing it in my YouTube channel. Yeah. So, yeah, for me it was easier, but I know like there's sometimes mothers, young mothers that are doing it. And then after the process, they cook for their children, and they're all around food all the time. And the family, you know, the husband kind of feels weird about it. And it's mostly about the reflection of what other people feel. You know, imagine right now you're sitting with Teal, and Teal is not eating. She hasn't been eating for, I don't know, a few months. And you're sitting to eat dinner, and she's joining you with a glass of juice or some tea. Don't you feel a little bit weird about that? Wouldn't you feel energetically that you're bonding over food? And then you, because you don't feel good with that, then you're actually sort of making her. You're making her feel uncomfortable about it. And she feels it on a conscious level and on an unconscious level. You will bring it up because it, it bothers you on a very, very lower scale. But it will come out in words here and there. It will come out with friends here and there. And that's the biggest challenge, to remain true to your path, to whatever it is that you've chosen. In fact, that's a question yeah. I have for Till now, because you're the emotion expert. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us more how food and emotion are interlinked together? Well, food and emotion are interlinked together because of the fact that we mentally link them together. It's what he was explaining earlier. It's that in the very beginning, we make associations. We associate connection with love because of breath. And mm -hmm. right, I mean, food with love, rather, not connection with love. We associate food with love because we all are breastfed. And that is that becomes our, our closeness. And then, um, especially in societies where giving is very complicated, <laughs> it tends to be the one pure form of giving. And it tends to be the universal language. And I mean, it's really interesting that I'm interested in Bavarianism being such a foodie, because one thing I love about food is it has the capacity to unite people. I mean, it's like a Jewish person can hate, you know, somebody who's Palestinian, you know, they, they can hate each other, but like, what's the same about them? They both love their food. So it's like, it's this uniter. And so because it's got, food has got that very strong association with unity, we start to feel isolated whenever we, we don't partake in it. And it, I mean, those people who have been on a diet know what that feels like. I mean, Breatharianism is just like way on the other end of the scale, but you know what it's like when you're on a diet and it's like, oh, I'm not eating that thing anymore. And then you go to the party and everyone's eating it, but you, the first thing mm -hmm. you start to feel is that separation. And so, so that is the link. And it's mm -hmm. the, the main link we have is that, that feeling of complete isolation, complete separation slash ostracization, don't fit in, don't belong type of energy that we get when we are taking in the same kind of food that everyone else is taking in. And it's because human beings need, because we're social, we need connection so damn much. It, it becomes very difficult to maintain anything that makes you feel that sense of isolation. And we use food to create uh, comfort, to, to feel better. For example, many women take chocolate in order to feel better. We all have our comfort food, is basically the food our mother gave us. In fact, since I'm in my early 20s, I wanted to be a vegetarian, but I always failed because coming from a French culture, oh my gosh, uh, there's so much attachment to meat, to our foie gras, and to a number of unethic, unethical food. So uh, I think only once before I was with Steel, I was, did three months, but that's the maximum I, I could go through. Then uh, starting being with, with Steel, uh, I mean, she gave me the motivation. She basically told me, Okay, uh, I'm not having sex with a meat eater. <laughs> Can I explain why though? I need to explain why. Can yes. I explain why? This will make more sense to somebody who's actually who understands prana yes. and things like this. So, as a woman, especially as a woman, we are in a receptive energy, especially during sex. I mean, there is ways that you can reverse that energy during the sex act, but in general, let's just generalize. In, in the female role in a sexual relationship, you are basically in a receiving state. That's why we're the ones that get impregnated, right? Now, when a guy is poisoning his body with the vibrations of, of certain foods, and when, you, when you're looking at meat products, what you're looking at is all the conditions that that animal is in, all of the hormones, the state that they were in, so we've got stress chemicals, all of that is toxicity, and it is horror. 
for somebody that can, can you know, perceive energies. Killing an animal in the way that we do today is it's murder is what it is, and then that energy is getting taken in by the body. So when a man enters you, sorry to get graphic, essentially, he's got a flow of energy you know, through his body into you. And so what happens is that as a woman, you're actually receiving all the toxicity in the man. And so, and, I mean, positive and negative. And so when a guy eats meat, it literally feels as if that horror is being transferred in through my cells. And so it was like, hell no. So on that level, no sex with a guy who eats meat. Now on another level, I don't want to be in a partnership with somebody who isn't dedicated to reducing suffering on this planet. You cannot call yourself an environmentalist today and eat meat. Nor can you say I'm going to reduce suffering on the planet and eat meat. It is, it's a complete contradiction for me. And so if I'm going to choose a life partner, mm -hmm. it is going to be somebody who is on that path. And that was very really, that's so you, you, imme you immediately stopped eating meat to have sex. That's what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> so you can see the priorities for a Frenchman. We are very attached to our food, but we are even more attached to to love and our women. But anyway, uh, that was the first step. Then I, I watch a lot of movies to be more sensitive yeah, I, with not, animal suffering. Because I'm not satisfied, just so people know. Like, I'm not a control freak. It's not like yeah. I'm, I'm satisfied with a guy in a relationship who's like, I'm just doing this for you. No, it pisses me off. Yeah, too much pressure like, for her. You have to, this has to be a choice that's yours. Like, I'm setting my boundary, but this, I don't want this to be just because of Teal. I want to be with a guy who, if I'm out of the picture, still has the same type of values. So I was like, you have to be aware of what you're eating. Like, end of story. You can't just be unconsciously putting stuff in your mouth. So let's take a look at what you're eating here. So I was like, mm -hmm. look, you're going to watch documentaries. You're going to see what happens in slaughterhouses. And that was the first time he faced that. And that was the end of it for him. So mm -hmm. Yeah, and for this reason, I think for me, I, now I have less, less attachment to food. So it's going to be easier uh, from that perspective. But for many people, they still have a lot of attachment to their vegetarian food or their vegan food. So now they need to convince their mind the new benefits they're gonna get by becoming a breatharian. I think some, yes, as you said, they're gonna limit the suffering on this planet. That's why I'm the most attracted to yeah. it. Well, besides the fact that I can feel, in my body I don't like the feeling of dependence on anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I, I, love the, I love those modes that I'm in when I'm in the most creative artistic phase and it literally does feel like all of my pores have opened. And like I'm not just pulling in energy from you know, my mouth, it's from every single cell in my body. It's like an open channel and from, from an extrasensory perspective, it's exactly what it looks like when you meet somebody who's a pure breatharian but doing it in the right way. All of their channels, every chakra is open and just sucking in universal energy, but it does, it's not energy that belongs to anything. So for, you know, for me, what really appeals to me is the idea that, that you can live in a state of harmony where you're not stealing energy from something else. I love that concept. So, yes, that would be and a And so dependency because sometimes you get angry and you have to stop your creative flow. Yep. So, uh, but, so more energy, that would be another benefit. So let's go over all the benefits you see of becoming a breatharian, right? Okay, sure. Well, we can split it into a few categories. The first one is obviously health, meaning you're prolonging your life. The only thing that right now science actually concurs is that when you eat less, you live longer and then in a healthier state. It's called caloric restriction. You've probably heard about it. Um, all, it works on all mammals and it makes completely sense because the body actually knows how to be more creative with its energy and it reduces everything that it doesn't really need. So health, it also means that you're consciously in a higher state, you understand what is sickness and you know that you are not this body, you know you are the consciousness and therefore you have more control over your health. I don't get sick anymore, I don't need to, there's no reason for that, there's no emotional baggage that I'm keeping inside. As you can say, I say whatever is on my mind, sometimes without any tact. I don't think about what used to be and I contemplate what's going to happen. I'm not afraid. I'm just present in this right now all the time. That's what I love about it. Now, health-wise, solved. After that, spirituality. So first, I don't have to take from Mother Earth. I don't have to steal anything. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you already that it's the fruits that are the highest vibration of energy because the, the trees are actually offering them. Unlike vegetarian vegetables that are being torn from the ground or meat that is suffering on the way to the plate and everything like that. On a spiritual level, you understand that the mind is really over matter. It's not just a sentence you've heard in some lecture or you see it in superhumans on the national television. 
but you understand inside yourself once you go through this that you can climb every mountain and you begin shedding the illusion it's like morpheus himself is coming with two pills and telling you choose you want to stay in the matrix <laughs> or you want to step out of the matrix and see reality you know on a spiritual level i think that now if you have this thing when you meditate that you have a few minutes that your mind is still there now close my eyes i'm there i'm so so easily connected almost nothing bother, nothing bothers me now i can tell you in the beginning the first few months are harder it's harder because you're getting used to a new vibration and you have to let go of a lot of different things you break up relationships if you didn't love your job you cannot stay with that job anymore you have to be in your center and with with your real life purpose you know and it's easy once i, I did the 21 days i came back i saw that my relationship was a lie it simply didn't work and i was lying i was it's ridiculous i was lying to myself expecting it to work it's when my ego wanted to be with her it wasn't really me so i had to break up with it i had to break up with the relationship so we said health benefits spiritual benefits i can say the ridiculous uh, materialistic benefit of saving you save up money you don't spend a lot and if you do spend you spend it on like really good uh, organic vegetables to, and, and uh, fruits to make your drink or whatever it is a lot of people save up to like a thousand dollars a month depending on how much they used to spend least, yeah. this journey is a big journey it's a big change you even save up on toilet paper <laughs> Do you go to the bathroom anymore? Or, and how in, fun in, the, in the year, I went to the bathroom maybe once every week, a week and a half. Today, twice a week, something like that. And again, it depends how much you drink, how much is changing. Your body actually has cells that are dying and it needs to clean itself. And the kidneys are always cleaning with water. So it doesn't matter if you drink or don't drink, you will still need some water to clean the system a little bit. So the benefits have been really big, but I went into it because of these superficial benefits. But when I came out, I understood something completely different. I am more connected to my feminine side. I have become the observer of my ego and my will. And it opened up a lot of things for me. I, didn't, I came in because of the experiment, you know, the Ray is capable of anything and he wants to challenge this thing and challenge science. And I came out very better with myself less judgmental of myself and therefore less judgmental of the world in higher acceptance i started it all started to make sense to me suddenly i understood that i'm an overthinker and why do i need to think so much the really smart person is deep deep inside of me and i'm just a little thing like the edge of that thing that is the higher consciousness and that is the thing that i came out with that's the biggest present for some people Health benefits, meaning suddenly their knee that didn't work for 10 years, suddenly it works. They sit up straight. Two people took down their glasses. They had a number about up to one and a half. It's just because we carry so much toxins ever since we were kids. And this really cleanses that out. Yeah. And you see that you don't really need it. And after that, you also get into shape easier. You have more energy. You don't need to take water with you to an exercise or for a run. You suddenly become independent. You go out for a hike for two, three days, and you take like two olives. <laughs> you take two olives, you take a glass of water, and, and you're good to go. And everybody's like amazed. And everybody's like, they don't understand how it works, and then they're afraid of it. What we don't understand, we fear. And you know, I also volunteered to go in a, a reality show in Israel. It was called the Amazonas. Uh -huh. We went to the Amazon River for a month and a half. We were teams. And I came as Ray, as a breatharian, you know, as a mind, <laughs> the, the, you know, the consciousness seeker guide. Over here, I'm, I'm pretty known. So they took me and they really wanted me to come. It's sort of like a survivor. In the first five days, I didn't eat anything. But I can tell you something, the jungle is amazing, full of energy. Oh, yeah. I went out, I breathed. I didn't feel anything wrong with me, no weakness, five days, mission, task, everybody's, you know, going down on each other, everybody's cursing, everybody's, you know, they're missing their cigarettes, and I was like, in a meditative state, really happy, enjoying the butterflies for five days, and then I saw that it's, it's really ruining my social status there, because every evening when all the group came together, they were all eating and gossiping, and, and then I said, okay, I have to eat with them, so every two days, in the evening, I ate with them to prove to them that I can eat and I cannot eat. It's like a choice. And they were talking about it and that got exactly the media exposure I wanted. You know, that they were talking about it in front of the cameras and were like, what is this guy? Is he like a superman? He's so strong and he doesn't eat and we see him and the cameras are over there all the time. I was really enjoying that. 
You know, it's funny that you say that because um, one of the reasons that I chose this particular retreat center is because of the intense level of prana in this area. Oh, it's amazing. Like, Costa Rica would be the ovaries of Earth. It is insane. I have never had such imposing life force happen around me in my life. It's like going to Costa Rica, you, oh, yeah. oh my God, you will never hear silence again. Not one day in your life. And it's a whole different chorus during the day and during the night. The best way to describe with Costa Rica is like you've got a mom who's pouring milk down your throat and when you're done with it, it still keeps going. It is that much life force energy. And it's like just even the level of oxygen because of the level of vegetation there. It's insane. Like the level of prana is insane. You cannot imagine it until you step foot in it. So this would be the perfect place for a Bithyrian retreat. In a few months, just a few months, three months from now. Yes. Yes, yeah, so thank you so much for joining us today. Um, if those of you who are interested in this retreat, you can go to philia, that's P-H-I-L-I-A, center.com, and look up this retreat. We have, we'll have a bunch of applications, and then I would like you, in fact, to choose the people who you would like to have there at the retreat, not even me. And awesome, amazing. Yes, so this will be very, very interesting. And, yeah, some of our group may be attending as well. So... This is, I'm like super jazzed for this. This is one of my biggest passions. So I'm looking forward to that. So where can people find your stuff quickly before we get off? Well, they can just search me online. They search Rayma Orr or RaymaOr.com. They will find a lot of information. I give out a free ebook I wrote about my first year as a breatharian, a lot of different methods. I'm a consciousness guide, so my YouTube channel is open for whoever is interested. I have a lot of short videos. I'm not like long as long as yours, you know, 20, 30 minutes. I like to keep it short, five minutes, and you can see. I talk fast, I shoot fast, I think, I, I immediately talk. And I don't know, I guess whoever really wants it, you can just find us. They can just relate to us. You can email me in maorray at gmail.com. I try to answer within 24 hours. Sometimes I'm super busy with, uh, with other people, but I try to be and give as much information as I can. As much. So thank you very much for having me. You guys are amazing. I love you guys. And I'm going to see you soon. I'm so super excited. Yeah, looking forward to the journey with you and uh, connecting in person in Costa Rica in, in March. Mm -hmm. And now I know I need to challenge you. I need to get you bored and you creative. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. It was good to talk to you. Okay. Good thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Yay.